very high standard of uh, beautiful leather seating, you must see this. You know where the leather is coming from, how it was produced, what impact it had on the environment, what materials were used from These kind of questions are questions that are likely to become more relevant. And therefore the question, can we really find the material information <coughs> about our companies, our organizations, sustainability impact? And with materials, I mean the information that matters. Not so much, are you recycling the toner in your photocopier, but the, quest, the issues that come to the core of the, what the business is producing. The products it's putting out, the services it's putting out, the way that uh, it is achieving its results. Well, the answer to this question was surprising. Two, year, two years ago, in December 2006, the heads of uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Deloitte, KPMG, Ernst & Young, together with Grant Thornton, and I'm showing you the sixth name, in a way, in answer to this, they said, no, our current system of business reporting is obsolete. It needs to be replaced by real-time internet-based reporting, encompassing a wider range of performance um, measures. That's quite intriguing. They didn't fully elaborate on what they meant here. But that is certainly where we, all those who are busy with sustainability reporting, said, yes. We agree, because there seems to be quite a gap in the information that we actually need to understand how our, um, how our companies are, are, are producing and what is currently offered. Why should we know this section? And should we? But there's another interesting matter, the economist. Not exactly a forerunner when it comes to corporate responsibility matters, but a bit over a year, no, a year and a half ago, they published an article and they said, yes, this is now becoming far more serious stuff, and because it's more serious stuff, it's about time that we leave this to the experts. <laughs> <laughs> so please, all of those obvious who have been in there to the side, leave it to the expert. A quick techno fix is apparently what they had in mind. There's an interesting yeah. idea, something to say about it. Ronald Hyde, that's a lot of this. And Hybrid distinguishes between two different kind of processes of change. He says you have technolo technological change. And that is the kind of change where um, we have already invented the solutions, we know these solutions, we have trodden the path, we have experts, we figured out together how we want to do it, and that's the kind of stuff that you can leave to experts. He likes it, since he often explains it in the way of medicine. If you have an appendicitis, you better leave the expert, the doctor, to handle it and don't uh, go, come to with too many opinions as to how he or she should handle this appendicitis. You'd rather be quiet and get it out as quickly as possible. But he said, then there's another kind of change, and it is important to distinguish it. It's called adaptive change. And it's change in those areas where we don't have the history of the knowledge to come with ready solutions, where solutions will require new knowledge, will often require new attitudes, new values, where we need to find out and decide actually what we want. In medicine that can be the equivalent of living, uh, not so, such a blessed example, living with cancer. Often the answer isn't simple, do this or do that, there are choices to be made choices that will affect your life. And at that moment you don't just want to leave to the experts, you, as the person in the role, <coughs> will have to say how you want to take it forward. You need to take control. Leave it to the experts, how we want to handle and face our sustainability future. Make me think of this when, um, poem by Antonio Machado. In Spanish he says, Caminante. No hay camino. Tras el camino al andar. Walk, there is no path. The path is made by walking. And that's very applicable to this question of sustainability reporting. And that is why sustainability reporting is going to and will have to play such a fundamental uh, role in how we find a path to a more sustainable future. 
because we'll have to find it together. We're talking about massive adaptive change, where we will have to figure out what technologies are really valid and how are we going to use it? Who do we trust with control over it? <clears throat> and in order to do that, we need information very different kind of information than the, kind, than the information that is now plentiful available or not so plentiful available about our companies. And that is what the GRI is working on. The GRI is an organization that tries to <coughs> actually cause a revolution in how we report on our organization's impact. We strive to achieve more transparency um, over the impact in, in, uh, in relation to uh, sustainability, so <coughs> impact on the environmental, social, and the economic level. Both to help companies and organizations inside, as well as to exercise more accountability. The fundamental is that a dialogue between the organization and our stakeholders. There's a growing number of sustain so-called sustainability reports, and they go by all kinds of names, and some people have called conferences about what should it be called. <laughs> is it corporate responsibility report? Is it a corporate citizens report? Perhaps, or is it just social responsibility, or is it sustainability? Shakespeare said, a rose by any other name would surely just smell just as sweet, so that's not going to happen. These kind of reports that talk about what effect does my products or do my services or do the way that I work, what effect does it have on our environment? What effect does it have on the economy? Not what are my financial results, but how am I affecting employment? How am I affecting infrastructure? What's my supply chain doing? What in fact effect does it have on social relations, health and safety, human rights, child labor, issues like that? These supports are becoming <coughs> more solid. More and more companies are working with them. Um, and more and more people who actually want to know about them. And that is growing. And it's actually these kind of reports have a double effect. This kind of reporting, if you go to the verb, is a two-way street process. Because it helps companies, and if we take the example of Toyota, it helps Toyota to actually see, to tell its, its, its audience, its, um, all its stakeholders, what impact its operations have on the environment, on the economy, on society. So, more transparency. But it also helps them to look at the business structure. To actually see now, what... When we look to that, and Sweden had recently joined, um, my firm now, we are looking at convincing the Danes uh, to do the same. And what I would also say is, um, what do you think, or what you saw, um, helping uh, reach that tipping point that you know, the UK and Japan reach for their companies, but it's really reached uh, in passing that law to make it de facto obligatory for a state of enterprises to to, to, to GRI report. I'm not quite sure. And that is what I meant. It's a viral strategy. I'm not quite sure. You, we, we've tried to predict the whole kind of smart analysis where growth would occur, and then we don't see a lot of it coming. Um, at our last conference, suddenly there was a large delegation from the Arab world. We have not seen that coming. And there's quite an, an interest emerging there. Um, so why this tipping point, and who is actually furthest? Yes, in, in the UK and in Japan, you have nearly 100% of companies that have, in one way or another, now qualified for some kind of disclosure on their environmental and social impact. Or, in the UK, you have the um, comply or explain rule, or they are saying we're not disclosing this because it's not important for us or because of X, Y, and Z, and they've also complied, by the way. Um, but it 